the streets. People need to know we're living in the war zone. Hit the streets with the truth. Tell them that it's What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Loot Bros Podcast. I'm your host, Resident Daryl, and I'm here with a slam pack show. I do apologize for the show coming out late. I know I mentioned weeks ago releasing the show later in the week. It works the best for the editing schedule, but I'm even still a little behind on that. I've been very under the weather. What I thought was just look, you know, regular allergies has turned into a cold. Then it turned into a sinus infection. Now I'm on the mend. Still sound a little nasally. I'm going to do my best not to wheeze in the microphone. But I'm highly medicated, highly caffeinated, and ready to roll. So here we go, guys. Got a handful of things we're going to jump into today. We're going to get into what we're playing. We're going to get into some pickups. Uh, I've got a little a kind word for our friends over at the PlayStation Ain't Dead podcast. Got some news items for you, some things that are really cool happening in the industry and some things that are really uncool happening in the industry. And then I got what I think is a fun bolo be on the lookout for. So uh, Gareth and I have not been able to line things up to get him on recently. He's been super busy, and so have I. So it, it is it is what it is. Uh, but I will give a shout out to the annual rarity event that he's been rocking and rolling, man. He's been really great on that. And I told you guys, I told you guys I was coming back. I said I was going to do it, and I did it. So I went from 11th place on this last update to fourth. I want to give a shout out to my boy MZ Nitro. He's been knocking out some pretty cool games. And, you know, even 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 the trolls have to realize that your boy Resident Daryl was going to show up and do what he said he was going to do. He called me out, said I wouldn't do it. Here we go. I am back up. So from 11th to fourth. And I'm going to maintain that top five status for a little while. I was in the bottom three for a good bit. Way longer than I needed to be. But shout out, like I said, all the cool games that are being knocked out. And uh, super excited for all you guys. It's uh, shaping up to be a really fun event. I know I've been been in favor of it for a while. Even letting our very own Backlog Beatdown take a back seat to this. Because I feel like Gareth has put in so much work. We don't need to... We need to put focus on where the work is at. You know what I'm saying? If somebody's willing in the community... Okay, part-time podcast host for the Loot Bros. If he's willing to put in the work, we got to get full support behind it. And I think it's cool. I think it is really, really great. So here we go, guys. We're going to get into a little bit of housekeeping and then the toast. I'm going to give a toast to our Patreon producers, MZ Nitro and the JT that one Seagal. I'm going to have JT on again soon. We hadn't, we hadn't talked in a while. JT, if you're listening, I know you're listening. Holler at your boy. Let's work something out. Uh, but yes, I'm going to give a shout out to all of our patrons. Thank you guys so much for supporting us and sticking with us. Guys, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to do something new. Um, we're going to do a little bit of podcast integration with the YouTube channel. By the way, Resident Daryl on YouTube. We're at 725 subscribers. I'm getting closer and closer and closer to meeting our goal of 1,000 subscribers. And when we get to the 1,000 subscriber mark, I'm playing around with some new tools, some new podcast recording system stuff there's another we've been using zencaster for years and years and years and that works great zencaster finally came out with an app just you know and it was perfect because now that i record at such weird times of the day it's like this is the best way to get a guest on and not have them have to actually have recording gear you know what i'm saying like the last thing you want to do is invite someone on as a guest and then them not be able to actually do anything so we use Zencaster as a way to circumvent that and you know get people on so they don't have to record it, just records the background. So all that being said, one of the, the the hosting site we use has now merged. I guess they've gobbled up Riverside. Riverside is a competitor to Zencaster. So now there's gonna be more integration with that. So I'm playing around with it and yeah, you know, I kicked around the idea of throwing some video aspects back into it. And I think what's gonna happen is once the Podcast channel hits a uh, thousand subscribers. That's going to be my kind of target to have video kind of figured back out into this. And I just got an alarm on my computer. It says that the air quality outside is poor. No freaking duh. These trees are suffocating us. I'm literally dying. Everything is yellow. It is absolute insanity here in the South. But yes, so that's the goal. I think <clears throat> I'm going to. We'll still have the Patreon. We'll still have the podcast feeds. I just think that I will probably, there's a podcast option on YouTube. And I think what we'll probably do is put some of the episodes uh, on, not everything on the on the Resident Daryl YouTube channel, but stuff that's a little more geared toward collecting. 
I just died out of nowhere. All right, so here we go, guys. Uh, that toast goes out to the patrons, to all you listeners. Thank you so much uh, for putting up with my nonsense. And good lord, the uh, the pollen is trying to kill me. So I might not make it very far, guys. So if I, this might be the last episode you ever get from me. Uh, like I said, housekeeping wise, we got a new video live on the YouTube right now. I've dropped a few shorts. We did it random. This will tie into one of our. Uh, segments in a little while we did a random pop in on a local retro video game store and i was not i was so like not record like ready to film like i never buy anything from these people it's not their fault they're a little pricey and i'm a little cheap and the they're in a weird spot in town where i cross by them every single day they don't open until noon and that's I'm never over there at noon. I go by there a couple times a day dropping kids off at school. So and then the post office I use is right there. So typically when I do go by, it's like I got two, three IKEA bags full of packages to ship off from our whatnot sales and eBay sales. And it's usually like I'm pressed for time. I need to go get something get, get be somewhere. So uh, definitely got in there yesterday. We we had a 30 minute window where we had to be in car line, in the actual car line over there. That's another thing. Uh, as far as our pickup schedule goes, I drop off there. I don't pick up there. I think the pollen is infiltrating me through the microphone because it's almost like it's getting worse the more I talk. Anyway, so I was there and with my son. He said, yeah, let's go inside. Let's see if there's some games on this list. We're building a list of, of games that we're hunting for. It's going to be our hunting hit list. And we're going to do something really cool as far as a visual aid to go with that for YouTube. So as we're compiling the list, he's like, let's go ahead and start looking. I'm like, all right, that's fine. We got 30 minutes. We're just going to sit in the parking lot that's adjacent to it anyways. Let's go look. So we go inside and we we do a couple laps around the store. Don't really find what we're looking for. And then I was like, you know what? I'll look through these like loose discs and this, this video game store. They're really cool. They're called software seconds. Um, and then it's in local to the uh, Columbia area. And they would they have a shrink wrap machine. And so what they'll do is they'll get a loose disc, they'll put it in a case, and then they'll shrink wrap it closed. So A, you can't tamper with it. And B, it's like a nice it like really does make the presentation nice to have all of your discs resealed. And most people don't shrink wrap anymore. They just put everything in like a uh, little plastic little plastic baggie or whatever. So it preserves the quality of the case and everything too and like i said they they, they do a really good job of of pre- their presentation's good they get systems that are scratched up this is not a paid for sponsorship by the way but they'll put skins on the on the on the system so like sure the skins aren't necessarily what you'd want your console to have but rather than have like a super scratched up janky looking gamecube you're just going to have one with a skin on it and if you decide to take the skin off then whatever so, uh, pretty cool stuff though. Pretty o- overall, you know, good place to be. So we pop in there and you know, we're not finding anything. And then I start looking through just the loose sports discs. Like it's like a, a little crate of them just on a counter in the very back, like second to last, I find spoilers of a, a heater, you know, a game that's on my list. that's gotten super expensive, $300 game. And I was super, super excited to bring that home. So I will talk a little bit more about that when we get that section. But let's get that toast. We've been, I've been kind of flirting with the toast. Thank you guys so much for all your support. All right. So here we go. Getting into the show. Let's talk about what we're playing. Guys, uh, Finally got to play some games, like really play some games. Um, I said before, you know, give myself a little pat on the back while I was counting or uh, shouting out rather the annual rarity event. I put in some time and got some trophies on a couple games and I want to share them with you. All right. So we're going to back it up to I've been playing a little bit of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge. This is not where I got like much of my trophy stuff from, but I've been playing it. Really enjoy it. Playing it with my son. We've actually been uh, playing the arcade version of Tur- Teenage Mutant Ninja-, Ninja Turtles in Time. And we've been playing the arcade version of um, like the TMNT arcade game. <clears throat> and it's really great. We've been playing the uh, the collection, the Cowabunga collection on PS5. And 
We've also we actually went and ate pizza the other night, and we we played on the One Up machine, which is, that that thing is really high quality. Like those One Up machines, I was always kind of a little like skeptical of, especially because of their price. But definitely a high quality machine and a great experience playing on there on that screen, especially. So we had a good time. We played that. We've been playing it a little bit at home, but it's like every time we get almost through it, we have to stop. So like we just start over. And I like the first few levels the best anyways. So we've played through the first few levels like three times, but we played some of that. The kids wanted to do some first person horror. They wanted to do some FNAF style, Five Nights at Freddy's style horror games. So we decided to jump into one that we never really spent a ton of time on. And that is um, Emily Wants to Play 2. A while back, I believe we even streamed on the Resident Daryl Twitch channel, which we don't use anymore. I mean, just it's rarely ever. But a while back, uh, we had streamed us playing Emily Wants to Play, and we're, we so we jumped in. Emily Wants to Play too, and we got some. We did a pretty good job. We got forty seven percent of the trophies, and the game is well. Technically, we got more of than forty two percent, but. As far as like progression bar goes on PSN profiles, we've got some of the lower end trophies, and now we're working on the harder ones. We've got some good ones in there. Uh, a decent little game, <clears throat> not near as difficult to figure out as some of the other more obscure first person you know horror games where you they're like jump scare like fests. It's just like nonstop jump scares, like you can't really do anything. So, um, not a bad little experience right there. Played a little bit of Jet Moto, uh, PS1 Classic on the PS Plus Premium. Game's still hard to play. I think I said something about it last week. I remember sucking at it when I was younger. Still suck at it. So I've been playing a little bit more of that. I'll eventually platinum that game. But it might take me a minute because I'm absolute trash. Um, been playing a little bit more Resistance or Retribution. This one will be a deep dive once I complete it again. I beat it on PSP. During one of the backlog beatdowns last year, the year before, and now I'm playing through it on PS5 with, or technically the PS4 version, because I'm going to do both versions, uh, with trophies. Super excited to have it. Not super rare. I think the Platinum's a 34% like uncommon, so it's not even like a big deal. Like, But I'm just having a good time, and I highly, highly, I can't say it enough, I recommend this game. It's really, really awesome to have. Now, that comes from a biased place. That comes from me being a um, Resistance fan. That comes from me being a huge PSP mark. And that comes from me being a, a having my all my nostalgia just tingling at the same time. So definitely excellent, excellent game. Oh, we got a package. All right. False alarm. No package. Just someone driving through the neighborhood that the dog was not familiar with. So, Resistance Retribution, pick it up, check it out. If you got premium, you already have it. It is absolutely awesome. Love this game. Love the experience. So, that's what's up. Last game I'm going to mention that I played is I played and I beat The Persistence. Now, this is that first-person horror game I told you guys about. Amazing game. Got its hooks in me. Couldn't put it down. I was down. I was sick anyways. So, like... Seriously, like hours and hours of just playing the game nonstop. Um, so I'm going to do a deep dive on it. That's going to actually replace what I had planned for this month's deep dive. So that's going to come to you guys here at the end of the month, probably in the next few days, really. But yeah, that's a game that I just, uh, we, we've got ex- actually just pulled out the PS4 and the PSVR, and we're going to play through it. The kids are actually going to do more so of the playing in VR because we want to experience it there as well. Awesome game. I will go for the platinum. It is a 4% ultra rare platinum. Um, it's a tough one. It's not going to be easy. I'm down to the more difficult trophies now, but awesome, awesome game, and it's worth it. It's just it's one of those games that was it got me in the right place at the right time, and I find that this happens year after year. Doing the backlog beatdown really like let me lean into that. <clears throat> now I'm going to give it credit to Gareth's annual rarity event because I don't know that I would have jumped into this one 
and endured it had I not been looking for some more less common trophies. Okay. So I know you, we got some haters out there in the group. They're like, Oh, no, if I find myself, you know, trophy saw people, have trophies, whatever, whatever, whatever. Trophies are an extra added aspect to the games. I know over the years we put more and more or less, you know, emphasis on them depending on the year uh, when i do trophy competitions and i'm in trophy you know it's just that extra nudge just that extra meta game and they're fun I, I think it's absolutely fun i think it's great when a game gives you an opportunity to play things differently than you normally would and it's just cool and so that is what i was after i was after a game that checked the box of hey it's fun I checked the box of it keeps me engaged because you can have fun for a minute and then like I'm done. This one really kept me coming back. And then you can have a game that like, oh man, the, the trophies are this breadcrumb that keeps me like chasing after. Like I just got to go a little farther. And it was kind of like a perfect storm with this game that caught me in a way that makes me really just want to tell everybody how, how aggressive. And maybe, maybe it doesn't hit for everybody, but it hit for me. And had it not been for the annual rarity event, I don't think, I think I would have kept it on the back burner because I just wasn't looking for this type of game until I was. So that's definitely, you know, that's going to be the deep dive for the, for this month coming up guys, the persistence it is, uh, by, from fire Sprite. I believe that's who made it fire Sprite. That is a team that, um, Sony picked up. So that's first party now, baby. So, um, great game. Great game. All right. Here we go. We're going to move into... There's two... Well, we're going to do a bunch of mini segments today. We're not going to do necessarily the big boys. First off, I know we've incorporated films and stuff into the show. I I didn't watch a single film the, this entire past week. I didn't feel good. Like I said, down, with the, down for the count from the pollen, the allergies to the sinus infection, you know, just running the gamut of all the things. And I just didn't... I didn't feel like sitting and watching anything. Uh, other than Impractical Jokers. Uh, we watched five seasons easily of Impractical Jokers, the wife and I. And any time spent outside of that was either in the scripture, reading the Bible, because I'm in various Bible plans and Bible studies right now, um, and uh, my, uh, whatchamacallit, <clears throat> uh, the persistence. I don't know why. I'm looking at the word, and I couldn't say it. So all that being said, guys, those are that's what I've been playing you know, I recommend you check out some of these games. If you have PS Plus Premium, you have Jet Moto and Resistance. And I believe at one point in time, we were given P the Persistence as a PlayStation Plus game. So these technically should be common and easy to get a hold of for everybody. All right, so next little segment we're going to do is going to be a bit of a shout out slash call out. So I want to give a shout out to former co-host of the show, uh, Big Willie Style, that is uh, Will from the PlayStation Ain't Dead podcast. I brought Will on in a time of need, a time where he was neglected and abandoned by his former co-host. You see, guys, you might not know this about Will, but Will is a very respected member of the PlayStation collecting community. Uh, and and you know what? From time to time, a pretty funny guy. As a matter of fact, I would go as far to even call him a friend. And uh, Will manages multiple <clears throat> Facebook groups with thousands and thousands of people, like-minded people, collectors, okay, in the PlayStation ecosystem. He has had on multiple guests across his two different podcasts, <laughs> Um, for big YouTubers, um, you know, YouTube hecklers. He's had on big collectors. He's actually turned me on, uh, figurative, figuratively, not literally, uh, to a couple different um, YouTubers that I have grown to really, really enjoy. Uh, the Collector's Luck is one of them. I had no idea this guy existed. Will had him on the show. One of the worst audio podcasts I've ever heard in my life. That cat had so much background noise going on. It was Absolutely absurd. Will held it together and managed to squeeze a nice, good interview out of the guy and sold me on his content. I'm I'm all in. 
And he also turned me on to uh, Mr. Rightway. <clears throat> now, I don't know that he had Mr. Rightway on any of his podcasts. I don't remember off the top of my head. But it is someone who he had shouted out or had had in the group or shared something. Somehow or another, the connection was made from there. Maybe he even just mentioned him on his podcast once, and I'll check him out. And uh, that is one of my favorite guys to watch. He's His content is just him going and game collecting. He did uh, the PlayStation Greatest Hits collection. Uh, he's collecting all the platinum hits for Xbox. I mean, the dude just, uh, he's fun. He's nice, genuine, easy to listen to. And he's he's got he, he's got one little bit where he talks about anime games, and he said those are for all them horny boy gamers. And oh my gosh. Not only was it is it funny when he says it, but then Will clipped it and put it in his own show for all the horny boys. Now, I say all of those nice things about Will to turn around and say this. I'm very disappointed in Will. And I'm going to say this to the community because I know there's some crossover and I know Will listens to the show from time to time. So, Will, when you're, if you're listening, I just got to level with you, brother. First off, first things first. Okay. This Jimmy Ryan hate, this besmirching that you allow on your podcast is unacceptable. Okay. This whole thing where you bring on former co-host of the Loot Bros, Matt Grinelli, current co-host, and and honestly, powerhouse of the Trophy Horse podcast. All right, you bring him on there, okay? And you just allow him just to run wild, like freaking Hulkamania, talking all kinds of crap about Jimmy Ryan, and just spitting in the man's face on all the many, many blessings that he left us with here in PlayStation Land. And the fact that your two co-hosts didn't think it was a good idea to step in and say, hey, wait a minute, this isn't right. You know, you, what you're saying is literal fake news. Not you, but Mr. Grinelli. This goes out to you too, Mr. Starscream. All right. You allow him just to get on there and get and throw out all this hate. And then you guys laugh and cheer him on like, oh, this is funny. Now, I can't tell, okay, as a listener, fan of the show, friend of you both. I can't tell if it's like, ah, well, I don't want to be rude. He's a guest. We're going to let the guests say whatever they want. Or if it's the fact that you, you agree with him. Because, see, if I invited a guest into my house, I wouldn't let them put their feet on my couch. You're not putting your dirty shoes in my bed. You see what I'm saying? You're not allowed to come into my house of roaches and burn it down. That is only for me to do because it is, in fact, mine. And I can do with it what I please. But you invite Mr. Grinelli in, again, former co-host of the Loot Bros Podcast, without even introducing him as such, by the way. Yeah, like, like Tricky just had this magical revelation that, oh my gosh, I should get Matt to come on the show. And Matt would be a great addition to the podcast. No, 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 no. See, the way it works is I bring him onto the show and then Tricky poaches the talent. It's always been that way. Tricky is, he's many, many things. And a poacher of talent is one. But you know what? I'm not mad at it. I say, hey, spread your wings. Be free. Be fruitful. Multiply. Do all your things all over the places. None of that stuff matters. What matters <clears throat> is that you guys continue to put out misinformation and fake news about Jimmy Ryan. See, let's do a little history lesson. See, a lot of times, guys, and for podcast listeners, you guys don't get this. And this is a, a this is a failure on my part, because if I was smart, I would. And actually, I have it right here. I bought a uh, a microphone specifically for my Facebook Messenger rants. When I, I go into our Loot Bros uh, Messenger group and I leave rants about all kinds of stuff. And I have it right here. And if I was smart, I would just record these in podcast form and then post them for you guys to hear. Because sometimes they're really good and I surprise myself. But uh, but what, if we look back at the CEO's past, okay, uh, for Sony, all right, you got Jimmy Ryan, who just finished his tenure this month, okay, with the, with in his position over Sony Worldwide Studios, okay? Jimmy Ryan inherited the PlayStation from Sean Layden from the PS4 times. Carried us through the arguably the most difficult time in human history when it comes to launching an electronic product with weird scarcity, 
a global pandemic, okay, unsure, unsafe, uncertain markets, okay, and yet Jimmy Ryan was able to put PlayStation 5s in houses, beating his competition, not just by a little bit, but absolutely dominating his competition, Okay, Jimmy Ryan gave us PS Plus Premium, where we get all of these old games we've been asking for, guys. Listen to me. I've been around long enough to remember when all the little PlayStation jabronis were out there going, we want retro games. We want PS1, PS2, PS3, PS4 games on our PS5. Guess what? Good old worldwide he who makes us whole, Jimmy freaking Ryan, gave it to you guys. He put it out there. You're getting them for free. You just you pay for your PlayStation Plus Premium, which is the same as your Game Pass. You get double, sometimes triple the amount of games. You're getting exponentially higher quality games. That's right. When it comes to sheer Metacritic score alone, you're getting a better bang for your buck. But now you're getting PS1 games, Jet Moto. Now you're getting PSP games resistance. All right. Ape Escape, let's go. PS1 and PSP versions of that one. All right, you're getting Killzone Liberation. I mean, like, you got the Resident Evil Director's Cut. What do you guys, what what do you want? What more could you want? You're getting all the stuff, and you don't have to buy them for all you cheapos and all you game pasturbators out there. All right, you get what you want for cheap. Or you can do, like, you know, some of us, and buy them outright. You're getting more. Every month you're getting more. Sure, you might not get 45 OG games all in one month, but you're getting a couple here. You're getting a couple there. We got Pursuit Force. We got Ridge Racer. We got some Tekken. We got all kinds of stuff. It's freaking crazy. We just got almost every single siphon filter that's ever been released, which I have the platinum in the first one, by the way. Like, incredible value just in the retro category alone. All right? You guys want day and date releases. Guess what? You've been getting those. This again, that game pass you know, mentality of I want it now and I should have it. You got more bang for your buck. You got higher quality. And you guys have the sheer audacity to say two things on the PlayStation Ain't Dead podcast featuring former co host of the show, Mr. Matt Granelli, Matt G. You said that this whole Xbox thing was a bunch of uneducated people making wild guesses and we're laughing from our high horses on ha 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 Xbox didn't go out of business. But we did get your games. Not only did we get your games, but they have been setting records as far as pre order on this platform. You know what that does? That does everything I said it was gonna do, guys. You're gonna show up, we're gonna show out, and then you're gonna get more Xbox games on PlayStation. That was the plan. It is the plan. And they came out and they did a little podcast saying, oh, it's not everything. We're just going to test with these four. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me back up. If you're going to test with four releases, you're going to test with four releases over the course of a year, right? One a quarter. We'll see how they do. If, in fact, this is just it, these four. But no, you are getting four prominent well-respected Xbox exclusives within weeks of each other. That's right. Within weeks of each other. <clears throat> Not only are we getting them quick, but we're setting records. See if these the most pre-ordered game on the PlayStation. Guys, that's huge. That's huge. It's going to do gangbusters. All right? All of the PlayStation news sites are reporting on Hi-Fi Rush. I pre-ordered it. I got it. Okay, it's going to be a big deal, you know? So what I'm saying is this, is when all four of these games are all completely out, the dust settles, Mr. Phil Spencer is going to go, man, we're making good money over there. Let's do it again. I'm calling it. I'm telling you. So sure, there were a bunch of people being super hyperbolic on the internet saying Xbox is going out of business. Xbox is closing their doors. Xbox is blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. But you go back and listen to what Resident Daryl said. And it's 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 come it's happening exactly like I said it would, guys. They're gonna do a couple. They're gonna see its works. They're gonna see it's great. They're gonna do more. Hopefully, leading to what I said would be what I wanted, not what I expected to happen. But we'd get a Gears collection and a Halo collection on the PlayStation. So, you guys sit there on the PlayStation Ain't Dead podcast, and you call us uneducated. <clears throat> then you turn around. And you make fun of the quality of PlayStation Plus Premium. 
you said, oh, Jimmy Ryan set the pl- burnt the place down, set it on fire, left leaving chaos in his wake, and then is running out the door. Not happening. None of those things happened. He got he was the only CEO or the head of of PlayStation in recent years that got a going away party. Everyone else got walked out the freaking door. Sean Layden, Jack Trenton. They weren't. They didn't like Jimmy Ryan didn't get fired. Jimmy Ryan retired. He came. He conquered the competition, and he left on his own accord. Now, now, just like in the Old Testament days, whenever, <clears throat> whenever the people, I guess technically New Testament, but just like in the old days, right? Whenever Jesus was on trial, and they said, "Hey, we can go through with." putting Jesus on trial, or we can release a criminal into the wild. Here's Barabbas, someone who you know is dirty business, someone who you know is a conspirator, a bit of an anarchist, got a rap sheet a mile long. You know this dude's a criminal. You want Jesus or you want, and they said, give us Barabbas. You guys, all right, not saying that Jimmy Ryan is like Jesus at all, but what you're asking for is Calamity. You're asking, you want Hiroki to Toki Literature Club to come in, and he's the CFO of Sony. He already came in and said, hey, we're doing some things different. First off, he publicly attacked Bungie, which, I mean, I don't blame him. He ain't wrong, but he said that they're irresponsible and they're not accountable. They don't know how to run a business. He said they don't manage their money well, and they're not accountable on their deadlines. First translation sounded bad. Second translation, when it came out, sounded worse. Hiroki Totoki is coming in to kick butts and take names, canceling games and shutting down studios. Okay? Now, here's the thing, right? Yes, yeah, so y'all said, oh, Sony London was closed down, and it was all Jimmy Ryan's fault. Jimmy Ryan was at Sony London celebrating with them, taking pictures with them. And then a week later, Hiroki Totoki shut them down. Do you think that Jimmy Ryan. Would really would have done that? You think Jimmy Ryan would have went in there and said, hey, guys, celebrate me. You will find I am kind, all Xerxes style, and then shut it down you know, as he left? No. no I, I know you want that to be the case because you want him to be a villain, but he's not. He's not a bad guy. He's good old Jimmy Ryan. We know this. Been saying it for years. <clears throat> so that's my beef with the PlayStation and Dead podcast and former co-host Matt G., it's like uh, I said this in our in our messenger group. You know, you're a big fan of Soundwave, right? The Transformer. But you sounded a whole lot like Starscream on there with all this ugly and besmirchment. Besmirchment. Bes- you're besmirching. I don't even know if I'm saying it right. I'm so so riled up. So, yeah, that's what I got to say. Then I want to give, I want to I aim my sights in to the Hunter Houston Sweet Baby ESG podcast. You're jumping on the bandwagon, my friend, and you're hating on Jimmy Ryan. And I I think you're smarter than that. See, see, the thing about you and I, Thomas, Madman T. Diddy, like, I resonate with a lot of things you say. You're a very, you're a very passionate man. You're like uh, Laszlo. Was, no, who was, uh, was that guy off of uh, off the Grand Theft Auto? Fernando. Fernando. He's a very Passionate man. So that's what you remind me of, TD. You remind me of Fernando from the uh, Laszlo show on Grand Theft Auto. Okay? He give the women passion. You're, all, you're very passionate about your game stuff. You're very passionate about stuff. This, but like, passion unchecked leads you into madness, man. You're going crazy on this Jimmy. You're jumping on the Jimmy Ryan bandwagon. I'm telling you right now. Unfortunately, you got to settle down, brother. You're just a little off base. And, uh, and, I, and I, I don't know. You made your little meme. I'm sure it's going to hit the internets here soon. It's not love, brother. It's not love. All right. Jimmy Ryan did nothing wrong to you. He gave you greatness. And you have joined. See, this is the problem with the Decepticons out there spitting nonsense. As they start recruiting people. Passionate people. It's like, yeah. You know? And a good friend like myself to you, Mr. Will, Big Willie style. To you, Matt G, Ender Phoenix, and to you, the Madman T Diddy, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to ask you guys to settle down, and as a friend, we'll just let you know that hey, you're wrong, dead wrong. You ain't gotta be wrong. You ain't gotta be right to kick it with me, but you just gotta be careful. Okay, what's that old saying? It's not okay. It's okay to not be okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. That's you guys right now. Okay, so this is your brother checking in, saying hey. 
Go check out these podcasts, guys. Go check out the Trophy Horrors, our friends over there. Uh, go check out PlayStation Ain't Dead podcast and the Hunter Houston ESG podcast. Those are our former co-hosts of the Loot Bros, friends of mine, guys I talk with on a daily. Really good dudes, putting out some great content. Super proud of these guys, uh, <clears throat> except when they you know, do say dumb stuff like this. So here we go. Uh, next segment up on the show, we got a little bit of a bolo. Now, this is going to tie in with our pickups for the week because the pickups for the week I'm going to be a little shorter with. Uh, picked up some crazy cool stuff. I got, a, I got a couple plugs. You guys, if you're out there and you're game hunting, you're game collecting, you got to get yourself a plug. All right? You need somebody on the streets in the sketchier places that maybe you don't necessarily migrate to. You need somebody out there who's willing to get their hands dirty for you. You grease their pocket a little bit, and then you reap the benefits. It's mutually beneficial, okay? They don't mind doing the dirty deeds, and you don't mind you know, making it worth their time, okay? You need a plug. I have been in search of and setting up establishing plug franchises all over town, okay? What I'm looking for in various towns is people to hook me up with large amounts of video games for a reasonable price. I want the cheaper, the better, obviously, but I know they got to make money. They got to make a living. Some people don't want to sell online. Some people don't want to be on whatnot. They don't want to fool with eBay. They don't want to pay the taxes on all that stuff. I am so far in, I can't see the light of day. So I got to have those guys out there who want quick cash, who make fast flips, and don't mind a little bit of negotiation. So here's the thing. Normally with the plug, I would say pay what the plug wants. So the plug, because plugs ain't loyal. Okay. They like money. So if you can get them money, they'll continue to come to you. But the next person that walks along flashing money is going to get their business. The thing that makes a plug valuable is that they continue to bring you business. Okay, that's what I've been establishing. I've got a gentleman who does storage lockers and or you know uh, storage units, whatever you want to call it. I've been watching so much friggin' uh, storage wars, I keep calling them lockers now. Uh, but he he cleans them out, finds video game stuff, and then he'll send me pictures and he'll say, "Hey, what do you think about this? Hundred bucks, hundred bucks." And he hit me a little high this week, and I had to negotiate with him. But typically, I don't tell him no. Uh, every now and again, you got to get tell you just explain to them like, "Hey, this is you're a little off base on this one. I can't necessarily make what I need to make to make this happen, but I want I want to be good to you. I want to make it work." Got another plug that goes to the Goodwill Bins, uh, not every day, but regularly, several times a week. I don't like going to the Goodwill Bins. I don't like getting in there with those guys and and pushing and shoving and trying to steal Blu-rays, TV box sets, and video games. Uh, from each other. It's not my favorite way to play, but it is so incredibly cheap that it's worth it. To the point of you pay by the pound. Some days you're paying 50 cent a pound on electronics. Okay. Electronics being video games, media, stuff like that. So you can get hundred dollar games for 50 cent. Uh, one of our good friends, local YouTuber Brock's finds Spent $9 one day, pulled out a GameCube, a stack of GameCube games, a Nintendo Switch, and a PlayStation VR setup. $9, because he paid by the pound. He found a, a bag, like a bag or a box that someone threw into a, into a Goodwill donation pile and went straight to the bins. It didn't even go into the store. Luckiest cuss I've ever met in my life. Always that way. So there are there's so much inherent value to going out there but you got to be consistent just like anything else it's not my favorite place to be it's not my favorite place to go so i found somebody who likes to go in there grab all the stuff and then sell it either inside before he has to actually check out or outside shortly after checking out and just quick doubles quick doubles quick doubles you know and so what i started doing when i noticed that this was the case was i, I started paying him above what everyone else was paying, okay? Because plugs ain't loyal, guys. That's how I know. And so uh, some of these guys, they go in there, and if they're not the ones that strike the gold, they'll just buy it off of this dude if he strikes. And uh, he sold me crate loads of stuff, car loads of stuff, filled up the back of his trunk one day, his, his vehicle, back seats and everything, boxes and boxes of stuff. 
I give him a fair amount over what he paid. Sometimes closer to there's that sweet spot where it's like I can easily double triple my money. Sometimes I get close to where I might not even double. Got to stay in the green because you know there ain't no business if I if I don't. So I say this. Get yourself a plug. Got myself a plug. Plug hooked me up with some games this week. All right. I ended up getting um, three or four out of this stack for my personal collection. And that's the best part about doing all this flipping and selling and trading and all is that, guys, this YouTube thing was always about hanging out with my kids, building our video game collection. That was it. And it's grown into something more. And now it's become like an actual fun activity we participate in together okay we're filming i'm doing all the editing because they're turds and uh, but my daughter's helping with thumbnails my son's helping with thumbnails and my my oldest helps with the whatnot auctions my youngest helps with the whatnot auctions and um my youngest also resurfaces scratch discs so in this past week's haul we ended up getting i thought it was three it ended up being four games out of a lot that we bought Mainly bought it for the Blu-rays, for the box sets, and a couple bread and butter Wii titles, some Mario and some Smash Bros. Um, But ended up getting uh, a copy of Fight Night Champion. Okay, super excited about that. Didn't have it. Didn't realize I didn't have it because I got some various Fight Night games. Um, But I'm at 512. PS3 games now for our collection. That's part of the channel, guys. If you're if you're like, what is this Resident Daryl channel? Is it more of him just saying whatever? If you're new to the Loot Bros podcast, the Resident Daryl YouTube channel is where me and my kids go video game hunting. Right now, we're collecting PS3, PSP, and PS Vita as like our regular. That's our focus. Are we going for full sets? Probably not. We'll go until we get tired, or until we run out of money. Maybe we'll go till we complete it. This depends on where this channel goes. But right now, we're not going on eBay, and we're not going in the stores and paying market value or more. Because some of the stores, they want more than market value. You know, price charting might, it might be a 4 or $5 difference. We're not that desperate. There's so many PlayStation 3, PSP, and Vita games that we don't have that we're not at the point where we have to completely source from places where we're, there's no margin if we decide to turn around and sell it all tomorrow. We're still in the good. Okay. That being said, our, our video game channel is just us going out and hunting down video games. So right now, okay, we have... 512 PS3 games. According to GameEye, there's 1,763 official U.S. releases, which I think it was over that, but just using GameEye as an as a, as a easy barometer to, to measure. All right? So we have 442 out of 1,763 games, which I believe it was over 2,000 and stuff. Well, whatever. Doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, some of the games we have are variant covers, like so. Like, it might be like the original release and then the greatest hits release. Uh, some of the games we have are it might be the original release and then there was like a Walmart exclusive. Okay, we got a sprinkle of those in there. Nothing crazy. All right. Some of the games we have that, that are not even scanned into our app are Japanese variants, just because they look really cool. Okay. But right now our quest is to the first thousand. When we get to the first thousand PS3 games, then we'll decide where we go from there. Uh, Same thing goes for the PlayStation Vita. The PlayStation Vita, oh my gosh, what are the odds? PlayStation Vita and PSP, I have 131 of each. That's hilarious. Okay. So that's kind of where we're at. We're just looking at collecting as what we find in the wild. And then when we get to the point to where we're not just stumbling across more, you know, titles to add to the collection, then we'll start really focusing on, you know, video game stores. And the goal is to never source off eBay. It's got to be in the wild. That's the, that's the goal. Now, whatnot is kind of the exception to the rule because I look at whatnot as like a digital flea market, right? It's live and you never know what's going to happen. It's always random. So there's times where we get on whatnot. For example, this past week I got on there and I got a couple games for the for the collection. 
I found a Skylanders bundle. The dude was doing like two bucks a Skylanders game, and then he bundled like three of them together for me for like three bucks or whatever. Okay. Okay, whatever. Skylanders. I didn't realize that I didn't have Skylanders Trap Team on PS3. I got it on PS4, and I got it on other consoles. So I bought this stack of games essentially to bundle and flip and, and, and just, you know, was being, a, I, I like the guy's channel. It's also being supportive. I was like, oh, I'll buy a couple of these. And it was kind of one of those things where I didn't realize I landed a couple. So I look at, at, at whatnot as like a digital flea market. Each channel you go into is a different table, completely random from day to day. You don't know what's going to be there. And so that would be the exception to the rule. So if in fact, we ever get to a point on the YouTube channel where we're game sourcing online platforms, you know, eBay, Amazon, or a GameStop are out of the question. Well, yeah, I don't want to go through big vendors and big, you know, big retailers and even secondhand. I don't want to go that, that route. I want to go to where it's random and unexpected because that's where the fun is at, right? It's the thrill of the hunt. So that being said, picked up a couple games uh, in this last bundle. This was the local bundle, not not online. We got Fight Night Champion. We got Dragon Ball Z Burst Limit, which is awesome because I just picked up the Japanese copy of this and was going to keep it because I was like, well, I don't have the I don't have the um, the American copy. So and it complete in box only twenty three dollars, but that's twenty. I just if you think about it, every time you go out there, it's like, well, I could spend twenty three dollars. On one game, or I could spend sixty dollars on a box of stuff, a hundred dollars on a box of stuff, and have two or three games for the collection in there. Hot Shots Golf Out of Bounds didn't have this one. I was actually surprised that the CIB value on that one was like thirteen bucks. That was pretty cool. But then the most, I guess, the biggest pickup of the week, all right, was two, and I've got a YouTube short out right now on the Resident Daryl YouTube channel where we walk into this video game store. I mentioned I started this conversation earlier. We walked in this video game store. I had a 30-minute window, wasn't planning on buying anything, didn't bring my GoPro, didn't even have my cell phone out. It was in my pocket. And we're looking through the Xbox 360 stuff because some of the more, I guess, the front-loading, what we're looking for right now for this YouTube series we're, we're building, we're not even ready to launch it technically, and we're here we are finding stuff. Um, it's just some uncommon xbox 360 games that we think when the store closes it during the summer it's going to be harder to find they're going to the value is going to start going up so what i'm doing is i'm getting a shelf and we're going to catalog this series and we're going to fill up the shelf and then we're just going to see this is going to be personal collection stuff and then we're just going to watch the value and see what happens so we go uh, that one of those games is blackwater we found it in this game store we we're kind of flipping through and my son has the list. My nine-year-old has the list on his iPad. So the idea is we build this list together. He has the list. We go into the places together and hunt, and he gets so incredibly excited, guys. He gets so excited about this stuff. So like, as a dad, all right, now this is for all the dads out there, all the parents out there, that is where the joy really comes in. Not that I'm adding more games to the collection, but that I'm doing this experience with my children and this one particular instance, when my youngest gets to be in charge of the list, and he gets so excited when we find something, it's like Christmas. Yeah, and we all buy our, our family stuff for Christmas, right? Think about how many times you guys really invest in a in a in a in a gift, you know, and you give it to your spouse, or you give it to your kid, or you give it to whoever, you know. It's like this is a big deal in the moment, and. And that's kind of the idea. It's like we're experiencing that, but like all the time because it's like that level of excitement. It's like, dude, we just found it. That was so cool. You know, it's the same way that it's the same hit they get when they open up a Pokemon pack and there's a rare card. And they're like, oh, it's so it's cool. It's crazy. Finally, after a freaking hour and a half, my uh, my sinus medicine is finally drying me out a little bit. So I can always tell because it dries my mouth out too. So. So that's the kind of the idea behind the YouTube channel, guys, that me and my kids are out game hunting, and uh, this particular series we're getting ready to launch is going to be a lot focused on the youngest man in the list. It's the hunting hit list. So we're in this store, and we find one, Blackwater. It's a, I, think, I don't even freaking know. I think it's a military-esque shooter. Not an overly expensive game. 
Uh, and from what I understand, not even a really great game. But it's one that I had never heard of, first off, only on Xbox 360. And that's where we started, you know? Actually, technically, let me back it up. That's a lie. We started with Dark. I already shared this on the podcast before. A couple of weeks ago, I bought, which uh, one of our, the, the YouTube video I'm editing right now is 200 games in two hours. And it's just like, we were looking for one of the games on the list. I found it in this bin and the negotiations started from there. And then I just ended up buying out, buying crate loads of games from this guy. So all that being said, this is the second time that game hunting from this list has turned into something different. And that's what I think is going to be great about the series. So we go in, we find one game on the list. And while we're looking, I just flip through this bin of actually technically while we're looking for games on the list, I didn't find anything. I flipped through this little bin of sports games and I pull out and I have it right here in my hand, a copy of painkiller hell and damnation for the PS three. All right. When I put, when I saw it, it had a $20 price tag on it. And I was like, dang dude, 20 bucks for the disc. I feel like it's more expensive than that. Sure enough, um, I look it up on price charting, and the disc only right now on price charting is forty nine ninety nine. So right there, I'm getting it for less than fifty percent. So I'm immediately I'm like, yes, I've never found this game in the wild. That's why it was important to me. Typically, twenty dollars on a disc only game I wouldn't buy, but I didn't have it, and I've never seen it. All my years of game hunting, I've just never come across this game. Like, I wasn't really like going out of my way looking for it. I just never saw it. And then here it is in a pile of sports games, disc only. So I grabbed it, super excited to have it. And it just also ha- it all happened. It just so happens, rather, I can't, can't speak, um, that I was in there technically pre <laughs> prematurely hunting for a game on a series that we're going to launch and then found this. So personal collection just got a little bit better. Like I said, forty nine ninety nine, And the, I was looking on, shut your mouth, Siri. Um, and I was looking on, on, uh, what the freak is it called? The game app that I use, uh, price charting. I was looking on price charting and well, there was a sold comp disc only last year. $150 for the disc by itself. There's not a ton of sold comps of disc only versions of the game. So, and there's been a reprint by a company called VGP Video Games Plus. So now there are second print versions out there kind of watering down the market on the game, but this is a first print. I even had it vetted by, vetted by somebody who's an expert in the field. That sounded very storage wars actually. Had to get it appraised. You know, this is the uh, this is the wow factor. Daryl Sheets says on there. So all that being said, guys, my pickup this week and my one of my bolos for you is freaking uh, uh, Painkiller Damnation, Hell and Damnation. So cool. So that one's in the personal collection. I'm actually going to play it. I'm actually right now in real time going to look up and see if there are trophies and if the trophies are any good. I feel like there's online trophies. Could be wrong. Could be wrong. All right, Painkiller, Hell and Damnation. It's a 3.3 ultra rare. Let's see. DLC out for it. I mean, all the trophies seem pretty rare. So, and some ultra rares in there. So we'll look into it a little bit more. And this might actually be um, something that I can, that we can uh, get some trophies on. So it looks like there is going to be some multiplayer stuff in there. But maybe the multiplayer stuff's designated to the dlc we'll see but all that being said guys uh interesting little game and I, I've, ne- I've never found them before so i'm super excited glad to have it in the personal collection now um next up was going to be it's going to be bolo so bolo stands for be on the lookout so here's the thing about bolos in the reselling and flipping community and even the game collecting community bolos are things that may have like value that you don't realize or it's like a bread and butter thing like you know Easy pick up, you know, you're going to want to have it. You're going to sell it, flip it, trade it fast. Okay. I was doing a whatnot auction the other day. Uh, and this is, I, I've got, I bought a media crate, a media, I mean, a media palette. And it was a palette of movies, um, 
So VHS, DVD, Blu-ray, video games, and CDs and cassettes. And it was mainly DVDs and VHS. Like that was the main part of it. It was actually only one video game in the whole thing, and it was a sports game, so nothing. Uh, but I say all that to say I I made my money back within the first week of going through this crate, and then now I've I've four and five times my money off this crate. I'm still I still have hundreds of movies and stuff to go through, which is cool. So I was doing a whatnot auction, and I was grabbing video um, movies, and just a two dollar starts. Um, 15 second sudden death bid on it. You know, I'm saying whoever bids last gets the, gets the goose. I pull out a disgusting horror film called human centipede. Now, if you're not familiar with human centipede, it's, it's gross. And I, I, I'm not, I'm not even, I've never watched it. Actually, I've, I've seen like clips or previews or whatever. Uh, I've seen references to it on South Park over the years or, you know, little, little videos, like parody videos, making fun of it. I've never watched the film. I have zero intention on watching any of these human centipede films, but I put it up there. I'm like, Oh, who wants this gross centipede movie? And, and, and I sold it and a bunch of people start commenting about it and they start tagging other people to come in and, you know, and look at it and like join my auction. Oh, we're getting great deals in here. I'm like, okay, cool. Human centipede was a hit. And I, and then after the show, it really got me thinking that doesn't typically happen unless you sell something so far under value that it gets people talking. So I go and I look and people kept asking for other centipede movies. And I'm like, well, that's the only one I saw so far, but I'm still digging through these crates. So I go back and I look it up, sold comps for the DVD used 15 to $30. I'm like, okay, all right. Look, not, not huge money, but I sold it for, I think, Two to two to five dollars. I don't even remember if it got bid on more than once. Uh, so I sold it super cheap, and uh, and so even you know I sold it for two dollars. It's worth fifteen plus shipping. Let's say on the low end, and then I was looking through the Blu-ray versions, and they're selling thirty dollars plus. I'm like, okay, so there's value here. And right now, when we're in that weird turn where big box retailers are getting rid of their physical media. And more and more people are turning to acquire these things because they're some of it's going to go up in value. It's going to be harder to find. And, and a lot of places like Amazon and stuff where they you have people sourcing it and they do FBA, uh, fulfilled by Amazon accounts, they're out there snatching up like they're cleaning out the Rite Aids. They're cleaning out the big lots. They're cleaning out these places that are clearancing their stuff. So you're you're only going to be able to buy this stuff on the secondhand market. Now, a lot of it's going to stay, you know, no value, but there's going to be hits in there. And what I'm learning is there's lots and lots of $50 hits already. So right that weird turn where I think it's stuff's going to go up in value. And and here I am selling it for two bucks because I didn't do the research. Now, do I care? No. If I sat down and tried to look up every single movie that I had, I would never sell anything. I would just be scanning all the time. So, yeah, you live and you learn. But something to be on the lookout for, for the resellers or the collectors or people who are into weird horror movies and stuff, if you're thinking about acquiring anything that has inherent value, that one seems to be one to to look for. So just thought I'd throw that out there to you guys. And uh, not necessarily something I would go after. I would seek after, but I found it. And now if I find any other ones, I'll clearly list them and sell them for the appropriate value. So we'll just say I paid for my education on that one. That's how we say it in the business. So uh, next segment, I want to jump into this one's pretty cool. This one is a little bit more, um, you know, we'll call it news ish, um, but it's not necessarily like a news article like you would expect. It's just a couple of things for you guys to be aware of that I thought was interesting. Okay. Uh, the game High on Life that released on uh, Xbox Game Pass, I think it's still exclusive to Xbox and PC. I could be wrong. I'm not looking it up to find out because I don't think it really matters. Um, maybe it is on PlayStation right now. I don't know. I played the beginning of it. Um, your guns talk and cuss at you. It's better than I expected, but it's not necessarily really something that I'm into. So I wasn't super, you know, I just didn't really care. It didn't really matter. Um, so, but it has a comic book. They just launched a comic book for it. So be on the lookout, Bolo. Hey, if you were into high on life and you're into the Rick and Morty crew and that, you know, 
kind of their style of humor, then uh, go check out and you know, go look for the High on Life comic book. Uh, in similar notes, similar news, I thought this was pretty interesting. Okay, um, you guys heard of the game uh, Ark Survival Evolved? Well, there is a animated series that just dropped. I think the first six episodes on Paramount Plus. So Paramount Plus is really trying to double down and get in on the video game space. You know, they got that Halo Master Cheeks, and then now they've got Ark survival on um, you know the animated series they're trying to do i guess what netflix do, did with like castlevania and stuff like that now i don't know if it's any good or not i gotta be honest i didn't love the art game anyways i thought it was kind of trash um it's just one of those janky survival games but the trophies are super rare my kids really enjoyed it they really they played the full out of it for several months uh, i don't like games like that so i don't necessarily have a skin in it but i know vin diesel is associated with the sequel I think he's actually in the game. I remember there was a trailer for it years ago. So we'll see. The animated series might be pretty freaking good. So we'll see. And I guess the last topic I want to touch on is something that is it's it's hotter as far as a like traditional news item. But this one is still it's still very early on, and uh, this is very very much. Becoming a thing. Now, I'm not here to sit down and dive into everything. I got a trophy. Uh, I'm not sitting there. I'm not going to go into uh, um, all the details. I just kind of want to give a brief overview of what's what what's happening. And then in a later day, maybe we'll get some guys together. And we'll have some actual in-depth conversation. So, uh, Suicide Squad, Kill the Justice League, came out recently. And it is exactly what we expected. It is not what we wanted, although I hear that the game is fun. Again, shout out to Will. PlayStation ain't dead. Um, after critical reception being pretty poor, and then the user reception being pretty poor, being, being pretty poor, this game was immediately heavily discounted. Now, I know there are a lot of uh, themes and a lot of diversity stuff kind of shoved into the game. I've seen some screenshots and some small videos. Um, so that riled up one crew. And I think we can all agree that it's not necessarily the fact that things are included. It's the fact that they're forced included. Like there's no, so much of this stuff is on the nose and, and, and not well done. It's not done in good taste. Uh, and I'll give an example too, because I didn't realize this until now, You know, like now is in present time. When I was playing through Gotham Knights, another you know, DC property, a Warner Brothers style game, you just randomly go in the belfry and there's a pride flag hanging up. It's like, well, what, what is that there for? You know, because like, what, like there was just no, there's no, first off, the belfry is supposed to be your secret lair, your secret hideout. Okay. You're there. Um, sure. I mean, yeah, you're there. You there hang out. There's an arcade in there too. Also seemed a little whatever, but they're younger guys. So I'm like, okay, I can kind of see it. But you just randomly ha- hang in a pride flag with out of con- uh, with no context. So, either A, you're dropping an Easter egg that you're going to turn one of these characters uh, into a homosexual or some other form of sexual, all right? Or B, you're hanging it there because you want to signal that hey, uh, you know, people of this community, we 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 notice you, whatever. It's ultimately not necessary. It's not necessarily game breaking either, but it's just kind of like for those people who are um, constantly looking for that because in every aspect of society and culture and entertainment, it's like, oh, here's the here's the thing. Here's that thing again. Hey, you remember us? Here's the thing. And you're not getting that, you know, for contrary, I guess, stances rather. It's just like, oh, here we go. Here we go again. We're, we're doing that. Of course, you know, South Park said it best with pandering in the panderverse. So now it's, you've, we've given, we got a name for it. It's like, oh, okay, well, there's the pandering right there because that's what, that's what was going to happen, right? You're going to, you can't put a game out anymore without forcing some sort of inclusion, right? Everything has to have it. You can have nothing without it anymore because then someone's going to write an article saying, well, you, your stuff wasn't gay enough. It wasn't diverse enough. It wasn't good enough because it didn't check all these boxes, which what that does for the creative side, guys, is like, well, what if what I was making didn't need that? What if what I was making that actually doesn't add to the value? 
Like, can things exist that don't necessarily check all the boxes? I think they should. I think they can. Should you have games that, like, are completely gay focused and diverse focused and not just gay, but you know, say all the, all the, all the DIE stuff, whatever. Sure. Absolutely. If that's what the creators want to create, then, then go for it. Now we know that the video games industry, just focusing on that one right now is primarily comprised of people who share similar values and similar, you know, viewpoints. So are we going to see this stuff more and more over time? Absolutely. Okay. Again, none of those are the problem. Whether you like it or not, the problem is, all right, the fact that it's just slapped on there like a sticker. Like, boom, here we go. Look at there. Look at it. Did you see it? Because we did it. And people see through that kind of stuff. And it's annoying. And it's like that with anything, though. It doesn't have to be you take out your diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? And all of the problems that can come from, you know, from, you know throwing it in there. For, so throw politics in there. It's like, well, our politics don't align, but look, we put them in there. Look at my politics. So we threw it in there. Okay. All right. Take that out and put religion in there. All right. Coming from someone who is very faith focused and has always been outspoken about their faith. Like what if every single time I talked about a video game, I mentioned whether or not it was Christian enough. You know what I'm saying? Look, well, well, there's, there's the Christian aspect of it. Like this game. Okay. I'm playing, uh, I'm playing fantasy strike. Okay. Where's my where's my token Christian character? Why is there not a uh, why is not there not a straight white male who loves his wife and has a family and supports the Second Amendment and has his American flag? You know what I'm saying? Like because it doesn't always need to be there. It doesn't serve any purpose necessarily. Okay, so this pendulum can swing both ways. And what happens is when you just start slapping stuff on there for no good reason, it's like it's I noticed it, I noticed it, I noticed it. Oh, I noticed it again. Here we go. I noticed it again. Oh my gosh, I'm sick and tired of seeing this. Oh, we're doing that again. And then when it's not there, then you get the the barrage of articles and 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 things that come out from the games media where it's just like, look how you you you're not this enough. You're not that enough. And it just it the conversation goes away from what it is to what it isn't. Anyways, all that in a nutshell. It's like a it's like boiling a frog in in water. You t- slowly turn the heat up, and he doesn't notice it. You know, if he jumps in when it's real hot. It's like, man, I'm out. All that to say, as Suicide Squad killed the Justice League came out, its biggest problems were not the DIE stuff. Okay, its biggest problems were that they tried to take a game that they tried to take an IP and and force a live service game out of it. Now, don't this is what you call in comedy. This is what you'd call a callback. But we're not going to use it to be funny. We're going to use it to actually justify our good friend Matt G and what he was saying about Jimmy Ryan. His opinion of Jimmy Ryan is under Jimmy's tenure, his legacy is that we are going to throw everything we can at live service because that makes all the money. And that may pan out to be a misstep. And I will definitely give you guys that. I don't like live service games personally, but I don't think they shouldn't exist. They're just not for me. I'm not going to play them. And if I do play them, I may or may not engage with the monetary stuff, you know, and over the years I, I would engage differently, but now that I'm, I'm just older, I just don't have time or or, I don't want to waste the money on that stuff. That being said, I don't think everything should be live service, you know, and if live service comes at a cost of something that I would actually like to have, that would be creatively relevant and fun and interesting. And then, yeah, I don't, I don't want that. But at the end of the day, you, you gotta, you gotta make your bones and you gotta figure that out. Okay, we go through tr- we go through trends and we go through all kinds of stuff in the gaming industry all the time. It was loot boxes for a while. Everything was freaking loot boxes, and you know, there was also uh, day one DLC and DLC on the disc that you had to pay twenty dollars to unlock, but it's technically already on your your game. Resident Evil Five. Crap like that. Like we've we've gone through some of this stuff, and then it's like, oh, what well, battle passes? Which I think battle I think battle passes are actually one of the cooler things that have come out of this stuff. Different ways to monetize and and milk you long term. And again, as long as they're not predatory, those things are not all bad. But it's it's just like when it. And this is the same argument. So for everyone who rolled their eyes when I mentioned diversity, equity, inclusion, let's just take that out and put loot box, battle pass, microtransactions. Okay, it's the same thing. 
You don't engage with every single live service that's ever came out. You don't engage with every single game that's ever had a loot box. But yet, if everything gets inundated with it and it's thrown in your face, and like, well, I can't even enjoy this without having to see it or having to interact with it in some form, or maybe even it is so loot driven and it is so um, battle pass and microtransactions driven that I don't want to engage with it. Take those words out, replace them with your diversity, equity, inclusion. It's the same thing. It doesn't mean you hate. You just don't want to do it. You don't, maybe you're annoyed by here. I'm like, God, dog, not this again. It elicits the same response. Okay. So my point in all this, all right, is to say that, yeah, sure. The live service play might be a bad play in the long run under Jimmy's tenure. That doesn't, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater or the Jimmy out with the bathwater for that matter. A lot of good was done, and a lot of a lot of great came from his time. But this might not be it. And WB is doing the same thing where they're like, no, 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 we want this so bad, we're going to double down on it, even though it clearly didn't work. What's that? We made we we, we saw Hogwarts Legacy, the best selling game of last year, surpassing Call of Duty. That was out there, but then we got this uh, Justice League. Kill a su- uh, Suicide Squad Killer Justice League grossly underperforming to the point of within a month of its release, it is 40% off on the PlayStation Store and only the second game that Sony has given refunds for. Okay, sure, someone out there is having fun. That's fine. But it's not great. We'll just say that we're, that we're the industry is telling us that this is not being received as a great game and the live service is has not been handled well. Okay, so we'll call it that. All right. WB's like, no, 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 we're going to do this again. We're going to continue to do this. Not only did we pander, so we really aggravated one group of fans. All right. We also made this live service game that's like not what everybody wanted. And clearly we didn't do a great job on it. So even though, yeah, sure, maybe the moment moment gameplay is fun, it could have been better. We have also poorly handled this great IP, these great characters, all right? Now, what I did do is I did watch a video breaking down some of the writing decisions in the game because I've, I've just, I'm not, I'm not playing it, okay? And how they mistreated the characters, specifically the male heroes and how they uh, treated Wonder Woman, I thought was interesting. I'm not saying it was wrong necessarily, but I did say, I did think that the way, I mean, the, the game just sounds story-wise, it doesn't even it doesn't sound like it was very fun, very cool. I I can see why if you you treat your characters like that, most specifically Batman. And I'm not trying to spoil it here for everybody, even though I spoiled it for myself. If you're going to treat them like that, like yeah, you're going to make your DC fan base mad. Okay, so you've made the you've made the pander fan base mad. You've made the I want a single player game, but you gave me a live service fan base mad. You're writing. You made your core DC audience mad. And then out of the ashes of all this, okay, we this is like coming off the heels. I say out of the ashes, technically no. Let me let me we're gonna we're gonna get to that point next. Where this is coming off the heels of the fact this is a rock steady game that's been in development for 10 years. And instead of getting another Arkham style game, which is what everybody wanted, unanimously praised across the industry, okay. We got this. So it's like, wait a second. You went from Arkham to this? So now your general Rocksteady fans that had a certain type of game in mind that they thought they were getting, they're mad. You you made them all mad. But then out of the ashes of all this chaos, out of the ashes of all this, what's really ugly to, uh, shown its ugly head, part of this Hydra, okay, is this company Sweet Baby Inc., now, this is the part where I said I'm not really ready to dive in on yet. I've been doing a bunch of research, been doing a lot of reading, and I've been doing a lot of watching videos. Most specifically, there's this guy named Ademion that I've been, I've been following. He's got very well-written videos, lots of fact. And this sweet baby company, this diversity, equity, and inclusion company that has been used as a consulting firm on many projects. Seems like this is kind of where, this is one of their bigger, I guess, colossal failures. And not even so much that they're, that they're at, they're 
what they've added as far as writing and pandering and then you got to check this box, you got to do this, blah, blah, blah. None of that. I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking about any of that right now. Apparently, because of this, this game and games like it, they got on the radar of the Steam community. A user in Steam creates a tool, like a curation tool. It says here, um, every game that St- Sweet Baby worked on. So then it hit 100,000 people, okay? Had at, at one point in time, it's more than that now, but at one point in time, 100,000 people had found this tool and started using it because it's like, wait a second, we're starting to correlate that a lot of the games that Sweet Baby Inc. works on, things are changed, right? Alan Wake 2, Saga. Saga was white in the earlier versions of the Alan Wake universe, okay? Then she gets turned into a black woman, which is fine, whatever. They do a good job. Who cares? All right. That happens. That That's actually happened in movies and stuff, too. You know, actors, actresses, they do the, 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 the swap every now and again. You know, typically, it doesn't land well when you make a change like that. But, hey, whatever. I haven't played it yet, so I can't speak to it. I hear the game is amazing. But you're getting on. You're, you're on. Again, it's just like the microtransactions, just like the, all the other stuff we talked about. You're getting on everybody's radar. All right. So then they make this curation tool. It's like let's okay, all the all the games they work on, there's something there's something changed or writing is getting worse. Like these games they worked on. So like they worked on Gotham Knights. And I can see their fingerprints. 100%. Uh they worked on Spider-Man, you know. And Spider and now Insomniac is notoriously known as a very liberal company. So it again might be that it was always going to be what it is, but there is a common theme in these games. This firm offers a specific type of service, and they're obviously, you're, I guess you're getting what you pay for with it. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't really see where they're making things better. It just seems like they're ruffling feathers. Okay, what they're actually putting in the games still though isn't the criminal part. That's not what I'm even here for. They went after, they went to Steam and tried to have this curation tool banned, okay? That is a major, major red flag. They even went as far as to have the user banned. Now, my question to you, Loot Bros community, Loot Bros audience is, why would you want a curation tool that compiles all the games that you worked on, that mirrors your own website, why would you want that banned if, in fact, you weren't doing anything nefarious, right? Are people using this tool to not purchase your games? Or are they using this tool to put all your games together so we can say, hey, we love their work. We're going to continue to support them. I, I don't know. I, obvi- the obvious answer, okay, what seems to be obvious anyways, is that people are c- using this curation tool to stay away from what you're doing because they do not like what you're doing. Now, does that mean that the first 100,000 people that use the tool, that, that, that have followed the tool or whatever, or even, they might not have all even used it, um, are they racist bigots who hate diversity, equity, inclusion, or are they people that are maybe concerned that you're not necessarily good for their games? I don't know. You'll never really know, okay? There's no way to go to each person and be like, hey, what's your stance on this? Here's a test that's foolproof that will let me know whether or not you're actually a racist, bigot, homophobe hater of all games or you're just you know using this to make sure you don't get games they touch because you don't like the work they've done or maybe you're using it because you love the work they've done either way the tool exists why would you have it banned you know if in fact you weren't doing anything nefarious okay on top of that let's say the tool does get banned which it did not at least not yet why would you insist on the person being banned that made it okay like, to me, that's just, there is a bad actor in the room, and this is, it tends to follow the same group. You know what I'm saying? When these people, these bad actors that are constantly pushing for their politics to be you know, put in games and put in entertainment, and then not only do we need it put in there, but we need it celebrated, and you know, and I'm, not, I'm talking about political in the big form, not just specific stuff. But it just seems to be there's a common thread with, oh, you don't agree with what I like? Well, you're, you, we should ban you. We should, we should cancel you. We should boycott you. Okay? So, sure, this pendulum swings both ways. I'm not saying that either side or any person, any one viewpoint is perfect. You know, I'm not trying to paint that picture. What I am trying to say is, out of all this Suicide Squad, Justice League stuff, Sweet Baby Inc. has uh, reared its ugly head. And the longer 
This goes on. The worst it's getting. It is already now deemed as Gamergate 2.0, which Loot Bros wasn't around during the original Gamergate. It seems to be bigger. Uh, I read some articles that and some opinion pieces and some hit pieces from uh, The Verge this week. Um, and I don't read anything Kotaku. I listen to other people kind of paraphrase Kotaku because I just I hate them so much. But I'm starting to see where a lot of these people are, you know, you know, coming up and they're writing their pieces. And then there's other people coming out saying, no, 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 no. This is what actually happened when she wrote this piece. Here's the receipts. Here's the text messages where these bad actors are trying to cover for each other. So again, going down this rabbit hole, my point in it all is you got bigger entities outside of games that are now commentating on this. Okay. Uh, one of them being Matt Walsh from the daily wire. Um, interesting fellow. I like some of his content. Uh, personally, um, I think that when it comes to conservative values and things like that, he's pretty cut and dry. He's a little a little on the dry side, actually, with his humor, too, which comes off as abrasive to people who, I guess, don't consume his content. I don't consume it regular. It's it's very random. Used to be a lot more back in the day. Um, overly pretty interesting stuff, but now you've got bigger entities outside of gaming who clearly have zero video game knowledge at all commenting on it. And then... It's, it hits the uh, it hits the sacred symbols. Now, I listen to sacred symbols a lot. Every now and again, I'll echo maybe an opinion or something that I heard on there, something I agree with, or I'll say something that I don't like, completely disagree with these guys. Most of them I do disagree with completely. But now, even the sacred symbols guys are, are getting on to what's happening. And the cool thing is, is I feel like with sacred symbols as a platform, we'll get unbiased conversation from with, involving people from every side. So we're going to get some really good stuff from there. But what we're not going to do is we're not going to get honest and unbiased, unbiased stuff from our normal, typical games journalists. So your IGNs, your GameSpots, your Kotakus, all that stuff, you're going to get one-sided stuff if you get coverage at all. But I just would like to throw it out there, guys, that out of the ashes of this game, a bigger picture, bigger story bigger fiasco is is it's it's happening right now and it's very very interesting and the amount of receipts that have been kept it's pretty troubling it's pretty damning for some of these people too um and i want to end with this because this was the thing that i thought i'm so glad people are starting to pick up on it because to me there's a this is like a big injustice, right? Or un, I guess injustice, injustice. This right here to me just seems like so comically unfair. Out of all this stuff, one of the people that used to work for for Sweet Baby or was very closely associated with Sweet Baby is an indie developer it has a studio called Validate, and it was uh, touted as an all black studio to make games, you know, that are centered around black characters. Totally cool. I got no issue with that. Okay. I do think that there's a bit of a double standard when it's like, well, to replace black or white, that doesn't necessarily seem that won't fit your DIE boxes for sure, you know. Um, but hey, whatever, you know. That, that there's no, I ain't gonna change nobody's opinion on that one on the <laughs> over a podcast. But I thought it was very interesting as a video has now surfaced, and I watched this video where she openly talks about how they do not hire white people. Excuse me. And they do not hire white people. And and it's because that white people think that what they say is okay, but it's actually a series of microaggressions. And she said that the best way to create a safe environment is to not have white people there. Completely blatantly racist. Doesn't matter what color, what background you put in that sentence. It ain't good. <laughs> and it's on video and it surfaced. And she's a she's a woman of color, so I'm sure we'll, we'll see some of the uh, some of the white knights come out there and, and defend her. Like, no, what she's saying is right because white people are bad, blah, blah, blah. All that stuff, whatever. But the thing that I find interesting and the reason why I'm bringing this up is that she is part of EA's Black Panther game. Which, if, if you think about it, on, on the surface, makes sense, right? Because Wakanda is, is an all-black society. 
uh, based on segregating to stay away from the white world. I mean, that sounds very reductive of what it is, but that's what it is, you know. And apparently, you know, according to the comic books that I've read a handful of, I've got tons and tons of Black Panther comic books, that like if they are left alone to do their own thing, that they have advanced their society and technology far surpassed what's outside of Wakanda. We've even seen that in the films for those of you normies that don't read comic books. So, hey, whatever. So, in my opinion, if you are going to bring in someone to write a Black Panther game, they need to be very well versed in black culture. All right. And they need to come at it from the angle of this is an all black society. So we need somebody who's really probably, I would think, really behind that. Except for the fact that she's just very openly racist about white people. And if that was the shoe was on the other foot, that would not fly. Even if you took color out and you just put gender in there, right? We only hire men because we want to create a safe work environment. And women are okay, except for when they say things that are actually all just microaggressions. So the only way for us to create a safe environment for men is to not have women Vice versa, so on and so forth, whatever. So, I do think it's very interesting that a someone who stems and is very closely associated from a DIE company can be so anti-DIE as long as the shade fits the agenda. So, why did I bring all that heavily political stuff up to you guys to talk about at the end of a podcast? We don't typically talk about that kind of stuff on here. Uh, I just thought it was interesting, and I think what's going to come of this is interesting, okay? So what I would say is if you made it this far and you're interested in, if you want to just keep a lookout, you know, just be on the lookout Bolo. Hey, for what's coming next, because this is already been coined and called Gamergate 2.0. As a matter of fact, and a division of the, of Homeland security has already started investigating and having conversations and you know, commenting in articles on well, this movement. They're a DIE division of Homeland Security. I forget their name. It doesn't matter. Anyways, it's all out there. Tons of research to be done. Uh, but what I think is, is what I've found in my research and what really, you know, again, shout out to Madman Thomas T. Diddy. Uh, he has an ESG podcast. And apparently all this stuff stems from ESG funds that require you to consult with DIE agencies so that you get cheap money. I didn't know any of that. That was, that was news to me. Call me uneducated. So all of it, you can always trace everything back to the money. And so now we see that there, there were funds allocated to make a lot of these things happen, to make these companies relevant. And these people who have become relevant are, in fact, the opposite, it seems like, at least what they say publicly and what they do publicly, uh, for what they actually stand for as long as the shade or the gender fits the agenda. So very interesting stuff. I think this is going to blow up and become a bigger thing. I don't know. I could be wrong. It could go away tomorrow. But right now, there's lots of content coming out on it. And uh, it's at the very least, it's been uh, it's been a nice. Uh, you will, it's like a, it's like the video game reality TV shows right now. You know what I'm saying? Like here's what's happening. Here's the latest movement. Here's the biggest thing. Follow this pair, this character. Follow this character. Follow this person. Blah blah blah. So very interesting. Again, nothing might come out of it, and I don't plan on spending a lot of my time here on Loot Bros Podcast digging into it. But it just seems so interesting that this live service game not doing well is really what caused. The uh, seal to break, and now we we see kind of some of the stuff going on in the background. That's not good. Just not good stuff. I think we can all generally agree that we don't want anyone banned. We don't want anyone to be racist and and nasty. You know, we don't want anyone to be hating on people for things that are completely out of your control. Come on, you didn't choose your weenus, and you didn't choose your skin color. And if you did, that was well after the fact. So all that stuff being said, guys, that's kind of some of the weird, wild and crazy stuff going on in the games industry right now. I thought it was pretty interesting. Figured I uh, didn't have anyone to talk to about it. So I'm just going to sit here and talk to you guys. Feel free to leave some comments. Would love to know what your thoughts are. Um, also, I didn't forget to mention that I started another game that is a uh, crime boss, Rock a city. And uh, our, another former co-host of the show said it was terrible said it's awful and i don't know that i agree with that i think it's actually pretty interesting so 
But all I've done is beat the first couple, first mission, and then I've done a couple of the like little objectives to kind of gear up for the next mission. So I am very, very early into it. Um, but so far, I think it's pretty dope. I mean, it's not great. I'm not I'm saying that, that, but I think the fact that it's got so many cool actors in it and, you know, it plays well so far. So we'll see. So I'm going to continue the game. I'll beat it. And me, who knows if the platinum is, if the platinum is attainable, I'll go for it. The fact that Chuck Norris is a sheriff in the game and that Danny Trejo is in it. I mean, like, why would you not play this? That's kind of how I feel. So anyways, that's been kind of the bulk of what I want to talk about here on Loot Rust Podcast. Guys, be on the lookout for the deep dive on the Patreon. I'm going to be jumping into that one shortly. And for those of you out there who are looking, I know a lot of you are out there fighting for to, for, to spread democracy with Helldivers. Um, but if you're looking for something interesting to try out, you know, I, I named out a whole bunch of games. On PlayStation Plus, you should go check it. So here we go. That is all I got for the Loot Rust Podcast this week. Be sure to leave nice reviews on the show. Let me Give me some comments, some feedback. Hopefully Gareth will be back on the show pretty soon. We'll have a nice, in-depth conversation on the Rarity event. And like I said, I'm in fourth place now. Baby, come and get me. Uh, MZ, I think you're next. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, I, maybe I pass you. I'm not 100% sure. No, MZ, you're second place, I think. Either way, yeah, Emsy's second place. I'm coming for you next, Emsy. All right, guys, appreciate you all. Be good to each other. We'll catch you on the next one. Oh, and don't forget, anime is still for pervs.
Let's <laughs> go.